January 5th, 1992, downtown Gilmer, Texas. 17-year-old Kelly Wilson closes up Northeast Texas video, makes the nightly deposit, and vanishes, never to be seen again. A two-year investigation into her disappearance is quickly turned upside down when the lead investigator and a local family are arrested and indicted for the kidnapping, sexual torture, and slaying of Miss Wilson. With more twists and turns than a country back road, the case goes cold as slanderous labels of Satanists, cannibalists, cults, and devil worshipers are thrown about. 30 years later and Kelly is still missing. We delve far into the details and evidence of the case files in an attempt to cut through the noise and bring the spotlight back on Kelly Wilson. Welcome to Everything Vaguely Paranormal. everybody and okay. welcome welcome back to another episode of uh, everything vaguely paranormal i am blake smith and as always i have my partners in crime for this one because we are covering first true crime for us miss shelly pruitt and mr ryan roberts and y'all we have got whew, we're going to delve real quick into this because there are so many details so many wills that are turning in this machine that is the kelly wilson disappearance um just a little bit of background this is a case that is from my area. I was born and raised in East Texas. Um, so I grew up knowing about this case and hearing about this case, but I never dealt into the details. Um, so I was very excited to kind of shine the spotlight back on her once again um, and, and put her name back back in the front forefront of this investigation. So uh, first off, I want to say we've got a lot of new followers over the last week. Thank you all so much for following along. Comments, likes, and all that stuff. We really appreciate that. As always, we're an 18 plus podcast, so that language may slip out every now and then. So just may given every us. now and again. Yeah, every, yeah. So. so, so this is Kelly Day Wilson case, and I have to tell you that I, 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 I'm sure I had heard of it at some point. Being the true crime junkie that I am, this is like my, this is this is what I watch. You know, you hear yeah. me talk about watching the Murder Channel all the time. This is what I watch. If if they've disappeared, gone missing some kind of weird <laughs> crazy event i've heard of it and yep. that is this is my i hate to say favorite but this is the tv genre that i watch the most of um yep. i love documentaries that kind of thing and the interesting thing about this is when we decided to do this podcast tomorrow she will have been missing 30 years isn't that correct blake exactly 30 years okay. Jan january 5th of 1992 is when she disappeared and so we thought what an appropriate time to throw a little spotlight back on her because you guys we got to find her yeah. uh I'm, I'm a parent and i cannot imagine if for 30 years i didn't know where my child was yeah that wow. that's got to be heart-wrenching for the parents and for her friends and family and so um these guys can tell you we have spent many nights on the phone mm -hmm. sometimes talking until four o'clock in the morning 
about this case. And we have come mm -hmm. at it from every angle we can possibly think of. We're going to give you some of our theories. And please remember that anyone we mention in this podcast is innocent until proven guilty. Our theories are our theories alone. They don't represent anyone else. It's our theories. And uh, if you have a theory, throw it up there on the screen. If it's one we thought about, great. If it's one we haven't, we'll look at it. Yeah. And this is by no means a conclusive, you know, or, or coming to a conclusion on this on this case. This is something that we'll keep in our files and ongoing ourselves with investigations and research and all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I'm with Shelly. We need to bring her home. We need to figure out where she's at, what happened to her. I mean, if um, anything, to bring closure to so many people who absolutely lost a loved her. one, who don't yeah. know what happened. I mean, if if, you know we can just give them some sort of peace of mind or some sort of solace that I mean, that will be enough. And let them know she's not forgotten. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's my other thing. And we'll get to that as well. So let's go ahead and like jump right in. So to tell you how this case crossed our desk, so to speak. Now, this is going to be that it's just a story because you're going to have to take our words on it. But of course, of course, was because we weren't filming, which <laughs> of is our course we weren't. <laughs> Um, it's our downfall on a lot of investigations. We if you are to... someone who films and would like to come and follow us around all the time with the camera running, you can come hey. with us anytime you want. Yes, but y'all know just as well as I do, a lot of the times when stuff starts popping off, you're not filming. Exactly. You know, That's there's exactly always that, that, that element yeah. <laughs> that yeah. you have to worry about on an investigation. So this crossed our path. Uh, me and Shelly did a little, I call it mom and pop investigation in Gilmer, Texas. We were very close to the scene of her disappearance. And we were at this location and we were asking questions through a spirit box. We were not getting anything. We got no evidence throughout the entire night whatsoever. Uh, and so we just decided to try a different tactic. And for whatever reason, I have no idea why, I Googled a picture of Kelly Wilson and I held it up in the air and I circled it around the room. I said, does anybody here know about this young lady right here? If you do, please come forward. And this male spirit comes through and he says, I do. But Shelly responds, who are you? Nothing. And then after that, I said, or Shelly asked, does anybody know about the tire slashing incident um, that took place? Same male voice said, I do. And Shelly goes, who are you? Again, nothing. So Shelly starts asking a little bit of deeper probing questions. And she's like, is Kelly still here with us? Same male voice responds with, not on this earth. And Shelly said, then where is she? And he responds exactly and says, follow me into the woods. Hmm. And Clear of course, as a bell, the yep. exact same male voice over numerous sweeps of the spirit box. And <clears throat> we didn't ask these boom, 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 boom. We asked a couple of questions and we were getting, those are the ones we got responses on. Mm -hmm. Same voice, and probably within what three minutes that was the time frame where we got these yeah. answers. But yeah. when I said, Well, where is she then? and it goes, Follow me into the woods. Yeah. And Absolutely. I'm like, What in the hell is this all about? And the obsession began. Yeah. And, and that, that's all that it took. So I looked at Kelly. Uh, to, hey, Kelly. I've had Kelly on my brain for the last month and a half. Sorry. <laughs> I looked at Shelly, and it rhymes with your name, Shelly. Um, and I looked at Shelly and I was like, we've got to cover this. We've got to do this. This has got to be it. And we need to get it done by January the 4th on that too, on this Tuesday. So here we are and let's jump right in. Let's go. Let's, let's get to it. So a little bit about Kelly Wilson. Kelly Wilson is 17 years old. Um, she is around 5'7", about 120 pounds. She's got blue eyes, shoulder length, sandy brown hair. She is originally from uh, Natchitoches, Louisiana. Um, she had been in Gilmer for roughly about a year to year and a half, somewhere in there. And she worked at a video store called Northeast Texas Video uh, on the corner of Titus and Buffalo on the north side of the downtown Gilmer Square. And she'd been there for probably about maybe six months. Um, she began attending Gilmer High School her junior year. And a lot of the sources that I talked to up there, plus what I had kind of found in some articles, said she was a very well-rounded person. She was an AV student. <laughs> she was a social girl, and some said that she was kind of a life of the party. Um, but she was beautiful. Um, a lot of sources said that they were popular, though, with many friends that though that the kids really didn't get a chance to get to know her. She'd only been there for for, you know, year, year and a half. Um, she was in Natchez, Louisiana. She was the FFA sweetheart um, prior to moving here. Uh, she had her mother says she had a lot of acquaintances, male, female, different ages. She wasn't the type really to stay home. So, of course, you know, you're 17 years old. What do we all do? We want to go run the roads. We want to go have fun, mm -hmm. spend time with our friends. Typical teenager. Um, Hell typical I know teenager. I <laughs> but, that, but that she always let her mother and her stepfather know where her whereabouts were. 
Mm -hmm. um, and her father says the same thing. Now, her father is in uh, uh, back in Louisiana with her stepmother. And he says the same thing. He says it didn't matter if the person was eight or 80. She made a friend in them. She never met a stranger. Um, relatives describe her as outgoing um, as well with numerous acquaintances uh, who did, again, always let her family know where she was going or what she was doing. Um, and there were a couple of sources I talked to who said she had a little bit of wild side, but who didn't at 17? Who didn't at 17? You know? you're, you're pushing the boundaries, <laughs> mm -hmm. pushing your limits, trying exactly. to explore and figure out who oh, you yes. are and who you want to be. And yeah, who, who, exactly. we're, we're not going to falter for being a teenager. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, not, not at all. And so I do believe that this photo is one of her school photos. Um, from what I understand, I got this from CBS news. Um, but you can tell a beautiful young girl with, with a full life ahead of her. Um, and then we get to January 5th of 1992. So on January the 5th of 1992, Kelly is at work at North Texas video store. Uh, it is her and her coworker, manager, and owner of the video store, Joe Henry. They are the only two there. They lock up, they leave at about 8.30, and they get into their respective vehicles and part ways. Now, Kelly has the night deposit, so Kelly goes to the motor bank. And just to give you a little idea of where everything's at, this is the location. You can see the, the yellow markers. You see the one almost dead center in the screen that says NTV. That's the video store. You see the one right above, just to the right, says Gilmer Motor Bank. That's where the bank was. So being a night deposit on stuff, she gets in her car. She drives down to the bank. She makes the night deposit. Her car is seen on, on uh, surveillance video. It's right there. I believe it's the one in the middle right there. But the photo is very grainy, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and she does make the night deposit because the bank records reflect that at 831. Where are you going to ask, Brian? I'll say, now, do, we do know that it was Kelly driving her car. I know, we I know, do, I know, we do I know, not know that. We don't okay. know 100 percent because and it is quoted as saying the video was very grainy. All that they could yeah. see was Kelly's car and Kel and, and what they uh, was allegedly Kelly's arm. Mm -hmm. So we don't exactly know if she was the one that was driving her car, mm -hmm. but it is assumed that her car is then found back at North Texas video. So I do believe that what happened was. At that time, as she's at the bank, she realizes she's got a flat tire. Something's wrong with her back left tire on the driver's side. So she drives back to um, the, the video store, parks her car on the side where she usually parks it. And that is the last of where her whereabouts of where she's at. So a lot of people ask, OK, she was there six months. She was a 17 year old girl. Why is she making the night deposit? Mm -hmm. Well, I couldn't that really That was my find... first question. If you yeah. have a manager, why is the manager putting the new employee in charge of making the night deposit. Right. So that was my one of my first questions. Mm -hmm. That that seems weird to me. Yeah. Doesn't the manager usually True. make the deposits? Anyway. And, the, and the only thing that we can think of, we talked to a couple of people who grew up in small towns, different from Gilmer. We talked to a couple of people in Gilmer. They were like, look, it's a small town. It's 17 years old. I myself was making deposits for mm -hmm. this company, that company. So maybe it was just a situation that it was a small town and Gilmer is still a small town. Um, that is just, a, you know, a trust thing. Um, with this kid, what were you going to say, Ryan? I'm saying, and pl plus two, like, do we know how old Joe Henry was at the time? Was he? He, he was a he was around much older, thirty. Man. Yes, he was. He was around, I believe, thirty-seven or thirty-eight, something. Like that. Okay, so yeah, I mean, he's probably just like says so a small town. He trusts her. He's like, you know, I really don't feel like dropping that off. Would you mind yeah. going around the corner? Yeah. And it's just right there. Well, Would you mind just doing that for me, please? Yeah. And he does also state that he does have a a, a mother with with failing health at home okay. at the time. Um, that he did need to go home and, and help take care of. So I can understand why she is making the money. So, mm -hmm. um, so again, she makes her way back to the video store after realizing she has a flat tire, parks her car, and that's the last that anybody ever seen her. Now, there are several witnesses that say they saw a 17-year-old girl, Kelly Wilson, allegedly get out of her car on Sunday night and enter the video store after her tire, or she had a flat tire. So we are putting her back at the video store mm -hmm. by several witnesses. Um, and again, that is supposedly the last time that she's seen a live. So she's had a, uh, she had a scheduled meetup, I guess you could say with her friend later on that night, she was supposed to go to a friend's house for a party. She never, she never makes it. So of course, being the person that everybody describes as she always lets everybody know where her whereabouts are at. Of course, people start becoming worried. Like, mm -hmm. we haven't heard from her. We know the store's closed. She's not here, blah, blah, blah. So they began searching. 
Um, and her car is located at about 5 a.m. at the video store. And uh, she's reported missing at 7.05 by her mother and her stepfather after her stepfather was the one uh, that found her car. Now, her car, still sitting on the side of the video store, is found unlocked with her purse inside, along with her glasses. Hmm. The black back left tire is flat and is off the rim as if somebody had driven it. So that is the evidence that we have to believe that she went to the video store and came back because she realized she had an issue with her flat tire. And did, that... Go I ahead. was going to ask, did they, did they dust for prints on her car ever? Uh, as far as I know, I could not find anything that's, that said that they dusted for prints. Okay. So I'm unsure. I can't honestly answer that question. I do know there's. No, I believe we did find something that says that they dusted for prints and they only found hers and then her her stepfather's who had gone to open the door whenever he found the car. Oh, okay. okay. I believe that we did find something saying they did dust for prints. Okay. However, they only dusted the driver's side door, I believe is what we read on that because that oh, became okay. an That's issue. Right. Yes. Why yes, did yes, they yes. not dust the rearview mirror? Why did they not dust mm. the, you know, the, the, the steering wheel? Why did they not mess the radio buttons? Why did right. they not dust, you know, the inside of the door frame? Why didn't they dust the passenger side door? Because it's also alleged that there might be someone in the passenger seat of her car. She's making that deposit at the bank, although the footage is too grainy, but we don't know. Okay. And they could not come to a 100% conclusion whether somebody was or was not in the car with her when mm -hmm. she was making that deposit. Excuse me, y'all. Um, so at some point, we have to work off of, of what we believe the, the facts were in this, which is we're going to say more than likely she made that deposit on her own because had someone else been in the car with her, that somebody would have noticed before they got backed out, hey, there's something wrong with your tire. Yeah. So mm -hmm. more than yeah. likely... She took off, wanted to get to her party, didn't think about it, drove through to make the deposit. It was like, oh, crap, I've got a flat. Yeah, so. and goes back to the video store. The only thing that is missing from the scene are the are her keys, the keys to the car. That's the only thing that is missing. So mm -hmm. what I find very interesting is that mm -hmm. she, she wears contacts, and she leaves her glasses as well, and her purse is left as well. Uh, she's last seen. I'll throw this in, and I know, Shelly, you want to get to the discussion real bad of this, but let me throw these in. Real I know. Quick. <laughs> I know. Why don't we? Why don't we tell the story and then let's get to the discussion? Because you know, know what hangs me up the worst on this. I know. I know. I know. We've spent many a nights talking about it. So, she's last seen wearing a purple rugby shirt, kneeling blue jean cutoffs, five separate rings, and a pair of earrings. Um, and both friends and family members say that she did not run away, and her mother is quoted as saying she believes her daughter was abducted. Now, wasn't that one of the theories whenever she initially went missing was that she was a runaway because she was having problems trying to figure out if she wanted to stay in Texas or Louisiana? Was that one of the theories that was put forth or am that, I wrong it, in that? It was a theory that she was a runaway, but I, I could not find any credible sources. I know you listened to a podcast about, about that portion. Couldn't mm -hmm. even find credible sources or documentation that says that she was tossing the idea back and forth mm -hmm. about uh, whether she should leave then or not to go back to Louisiana. I did find one that said she had, was planning on after she graduated to possibly move back to okay. Louisiana. But at that exact moment that she goes to disappear, there was nothing in the air about her running off to Louisiana. Okay. So in the fact of not being a runaway, I will now let Shelly, <laughs> she's biting her lip over here, I ready am. to discuss why she obviously does not believe that this is a runaway case. I'm going to tell you why she's not a runaway. I am a girl. And I know I go nowhere without my purse. Nowhere. You know what? Especially a 17-year-old girl. What are you smuggling in your purse, 17? You got your tampons. You got your phone numbers. Because remember, back then, back then, you had to keep phone numbers if you didn't have them memorized. There wasn't cell phones. So if you needed a phone number, you had to have your little piece of paper if you didn't have the number memorized that had your phone numbers on it. Uh, also, as female, if my tire is flat, there are, is one of three people I'm calling. I'm calling my daddy. Daddy, come change my tire. Well, okay, if I've had an argument with mom and my stepdaddy, okay, maybe I won't call him because the hell with him, I'm mad at him. Second person I'm going to call, if I got a boyfriend, I'm calling him. Get your ass up here and come get me. I got a flat. We got a party to get to. Third person I'm calling is my best friend. You know what, y'all? Yeah, Somebody's going to come get me. I have a flat, and I want to come to the party. Mm -hmm. I'm calling one of those three people. Daddy didn't get in a phone call. Friend didn't get in a phone call. That leaves one person who could have gotten a phone call. However, we're going to get into theories here in a minute. 
Yeah. The thing that was not there were her car keys. So if you think about it, back then, what a key fob. You had your keys on a car, on a ring. And on that key ring, you probably had your car keys, your house keys. And if you went to work, probably your work keys. So I originally was operating off the theory that she did not ever make it back into the video store. However, being that her keys were not found, that tells me that she took the keys out, probably put them into her pocket, walked up to the video store. And Blake, I've come around to your theory that she didn't make a phone call. It's been tough for me to get there. But I... I <laughs> I have come around to your theory that she made a phone call. Mm -hmm. So, but what's hanging me up is the fact that she did not run away because she didn't take her purse or her glasses or her glasses. If she's wearing contacts, True. you know, they might've been those yeah. contacts she could wear for an hour, a couple hours or so. But a woman does not leave without her purse. Her, 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 if she had a credit card, if she had mama's credit card. If she had her money, she had her ID. She had, if she needed a tampon, mm -hmm. she's got those in there. She's got her, her phone number. She's got her lipstick. She got to look cute. She going to a party. She's not leaving without those things. Women do not leave their purses. Not on purpose. And, and what, what this tells me is <clears throat> she probably knew the person that abducted her or, she went willingly with somebody and because she, she took her car key. She left her other stuff because she's like, I'm not going to be gone long. I can mm -hmm. come back and get my other I'm stuff. I'm telling you right now, no, Ryan. Y'all can come and get in the car with you. Mm -hmm. And I'm grabbing my purse. Mm -hmm. I might need a dollar for a oh, soda course. Pop. I might need my ID. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know. You may be a damn speed demon, get pulled over and get us both here yanked <laughs> out of that damn car. I might say, no, he's the driver. This is who I am. I'm proving. <laughs> no. Women do not go anywhere without their purse, especially not cute little girls like Kelly Day Wilson who's going to a party and she's got to have her cute little makeup on. She's a put together girl. I mean, do you think she could have been talked out of uh, talked into just leaving her belongings just no. for a minute? Like, hey, we're going to go around the corner. We're going to go do go this. around the corner we'll and do right what? Back. She's going to a party. I don't know. I mean, even if it was my know. boyfriend, I would grab my purse because I live in a small town, and I'm telling you right now. I have left my car unlocked many a time on the town square when I was younger, but I always took my purse. Always. Because okay. even if I only had $6, it was my $6. Mm -hmm. And plus two, there'd been hoodlums around there in that area. They'd been slashing tires because yeah. there had been tires slashed a couple of days prior. So mm -hmm. it wasn't that she was being targeted. There was a little hoodlum, you know, wreaking havoc, slashing yeah. tires. You had somebody, she's not going to, even if it's only her $6, $4, mm -hmm. $11, $25, that's yeah. her money and she's not going to leave it there to be stolen in an unlocked car. If the car would have been locked, I might have agreed with you, but the car was not locked. Well, do, do we know the contents of the purse at all? Or I have never heard what the contents of the contents purse Contents of the purse, I've, I've never been able to find anything that described the contents of the okay. purse. So I do not know what was inside the purse. But that leaves us here at a couple of theories. Number one, she did make it back to the video store. Uh, she made it inside and made the phone call. Um, and in my, I'm just going to say my theory, I'll just go right out the gate with my theory. The phone mm -hmm. call was made and the phone call was to her killer. That's all it boils down to. Then the question becomes, who are you calling? Well, Shelly just listed it. Parents, mm -hmm. boyfriend, best friend, manager. Who manager is the you. other one. And I have had a hard time with that manager. Let me tell yeah. you the truth. Mm -hmm. I've had a real tired, hard time getting away from that manager. Yeah. We'll tell then, a little more of the story and then we'll give yeah. you a few more theories. Yeah, because well, there is there is one thing I kind of, but yeah, mm -hmm, keep going. You know yeah. where I'm going with this. But mm -hmm. the, other, the other theory is she never made it inside and instead willingly got into a vehicle with someone that she did know and trusted and just happened up on the scene to help or help. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> That's Shelly shaking her head. <laughs> I'm about to get there. Hold on. Number one, purse is still in the car. She's not going to leave it. And she willingly gets into the car with somebody who's there to help um, then you have the questions of who the hell pulled up just being in the right place at the right time. Well, the only ones who are going to know what time she gets off are going to be family members, friends, and boyfriends. And the manager. going to be it. And the manager. And then you have witnesses saying uh, that she's arriving back to the video store with a flat tire. So that squashes that. So the next one is she never made inside instead was forcibly taken from the scene by someone she did not know. Now, there is no struggle, uh, signs of a struggle at this scene. There, there is nothing dropped on the ground. There is, there is no evidence of blood, of a shoe mis being left behind. The, or, the, or the red East Texas dust is not off that car. And you know as well as I do, if you bump into your car and you live in East Texas, you're going to get red dirt on your butt. <laughs> yeah. So that, that leaves me to believe that leaves with one theory. She makes it into the store, makes a phone call, and the phone call is to her killer. Now we got to figure out who the hell she's calling because she's got a flat tire and she's got car trouble. Mm -hmm. Parents, friend, boyfriend, manager. You got four right there. So 
at this time, leading into the next portion of it at this time, we got basically two suspects that go up on the suspect board. That is Joe Henry. He is the, the manager. manager, owner, and co-worker of Kelly Wilson at Northeast Texas Video. And the last person allegedly and the to last, see her documented yep. mm -hmm. alive. Exactly. So, and of course, that's normal police work. You're, you're going to go look at the last person that saw them alive. So, of course, he goes up onto the suspect board. He's approximately 37 at the time. And as we just said, he's the last one that got into, or last one to see her alive. When they got into their respective vehicles uh, to leave, um, and although throughout the times, the sequence of events of who got in which car, what, that's your hang up, Shelly. Who got into which car at what time to leave? Um, it does switch every now and then. Because the left story first, changes. They left together, blah, blah, blah. But his core story never changes. They left at 830. They watched each other leave. She went to make the night deposit. That's always been his story. Mm -hmm. so, so here's the thing. You know, as says I do. If I walk up and I'm talking to you and I'm saying bye to you. I'm going to notice if you have a flat tire. So what? He sees that she has a flat tire and he's just an asshole. See you tomorrow, Kelly. Good nope. luck getting home. Let me, let me throw this out to you now. You're sitting on a corner. You're sitting on a corner of a video store. She's parked on the side. There are parking spots across the street by the uh, courthouse. There are parking spots in front all the way down of the video store. Who's to say where he parked? There's no telling where he Actually, parked. Actually, I don't. I, you're, you're correct on did that she, because I do not she, remember him saying where he was parked. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Did 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 he go? Hey, I'll see you later, and walk out the front door because he's parked that way. I'll lock this door if you walk out the side since you're right there, and you lock that door, and they walk out separate ways. And he just says, "We went to our separate vehicles and we left." So I. Then the story goes. I watched her drive off, and then the story says I left first. Well, which is it? Well. We're going to always it depends uh, agree, on his to, agree to dis. We're, yeah, and that was my thing. It also depends on his vantage point. Where is he sitting when she's leaving? Can he see the flat tire? Um, mm -hmm. Does he even realize that she ever has a flat tire? So my thinking is, is that although who leaves when and in what order does switch every now and then, mm -hmm. his core story about when they leave, when he last saw her, um, what he was doing and all that stuff, none of that really ever changes. It's just who got into what respect to car at what time. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that I really did think about, I ain't gonna lie, I really did think about going up and asking him, you know, hey, do you remember anybody being in the store? Do you have any surveillance camera? That's <laughs> yeah, that, that was a question I was going to ask because I know we have bank surveillance, but there's no surveillance from the parking lot. There's no like other mm -hmm. videos. Honey, that was the 80s. Or, that was yeah. before everything so was you're on talking camera. Early 90s. You're talking early 90s. So I highly doubt that there were yeah. any any type of, of uh, security footage that was outside the store. And I don't even know if there's any security footage that was inside the store. It just depends mm -hmm. on what kind of kind of True. business he was comfortable with running. Was he comfortable with just the townspeople and good faith and trust and all that, uh, that nothing was ever going to go wrong? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know. Uh, and then the other thing is that I never found anything about maybe like the store inside being a mess, that maybe something happened to her inside and she was That became outside. one of my questions as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I never found any documentation anywhere, news articles, sources, or anything that stated the inside of the store was a mess. So, mm -hmm. because see, that was one of my questions. My one of my questions became one of her in one of our many three to four hour <laughs> conversations about this arguing back yes. and forth about our theories was I never, we, it, he's right. We never found anything that said, what did the inside of the store? Let's, let's say that she gets out, she goes in, she unlocks the door, she goes into the store to make her phone call. Mm -hmm. Now, if she did not go willingly, which I'm pretty certain she didn't because her purse is in the car. Yep. Could she have gotten got in that video store? Could whoever was coming to get her come into the video store says, oh, wait inside. Something happens. There's an argument. What was the condition of the inside of the video store? That if, could have been where the struggle took place. But if there were signs of the struggle in the video store, would it not have made it to the paper or would it not have made it in the police report or anything <laughs> like that? And that's where it comes to. Depends on who it was. Yeah. If it was the video store manager, he could have cleaned it up real quick. If it was a boyfriend and maybe he just yelled at her and hit her and then all of a sudden she goes out and and then now he's got to get her out of there, perhaps there wasn't a miss. Yeah. But mm -hmm. so that also know. that also lead, led me to the question of where are the phone records? Let's see if she really did <laughs> make it. <laughs> yeah, if she right. really did make happen. it inside the store to make the phone call. Let's see if there is a phone record of her making a phone call. And to who was it to? 
I oh, child, we st- yeah, we started looking. That was one. <laughs> that was the night we had everything up. We found out that you, they only keep and different companies keep phone records for different amounts of time. Some of them keep them for up to two years now. Some of them, three months. Yeah, I was like, I think we found yeah. during Depends that on article the carrier. around that time, it was anywhere between three and six months is how long they were supposed to keep the phone. Damn. Records. So those are long gone. They're lost oh, yeah. forever. We do not <laughs> yes. know if she ever placed a phone call, yeah. and that mm-hmm. truly is what all of this pivots on. Because it pivots on is, did she make a phone call? Yeah. Because Blake is exactly right. If she mm-hmm. did, she called the person who killed her. Yeah, that's exactly mm-hmm. it. Uh, and then the only other suspect, oh, uh, Joe Henry as well. I'm just going to go ahead and say just this. Just name off because, the suspects. Because I know, because he was cleared off my suspect board very quickly. Um, I, found his, uh, uh, po- I found his polygraph test uh, relatively early on in this investigation where he was... Uh, uh, administered this early on in the investigation um, about his whereabouts, what happened that night, and all that stuff, and he basically passed with flying colors. Um, now, I know Shelly and I have had some contentious arguments and discussions about polygraph tests and about whether you can... They are not admissible in court for a reason, because you can beat them. I know. And can, nobody, nobody that... ever went and asked Mama, hey, did Joe Henry get home on time tonight? Is Nobody ever went and asked old Aileen Mama if Joe Henry came straight home. Hmm. It's very true. Well, what hmm. I'm saying is you can beat polygraph tests, but I don't know if he, in 1992, in the middle of East Texas, would have the knowledge in order to beat a polygraph test. Maybe he would, but I don't, I don't think that he would. And now we know he's not the, the nicest character because uh, on re- upon research – you know, there's some things that came up uh, later on with uh, later law enforcement. On. Yeah, yeah, later, later yeah. on. But I don't think, um, me personally, I don't think he had anything to do with it. I don't either. I don't. I think he could be cleared off super early, mm-hmm. in my opinion. I ain't eliminating nobody yet. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> so then the only other suspect that you have at this time of the night of her disappearance is you have Christopher or Chris Ditton. This is Kelly's on-again, off-again boyfriend. At Say time. the name again, please. Your Your mic was really low right then. Christopher Chris, he goes by Chris Denton. Thank you. Just like just like the city north of Dallas, Denton. Mm-hmm. Um, he, like I said, he's he's Kelly's boyfriend. On again, off again, off again. Not sure what period they were in at the time, but he's her boyfriend at the time. He's approximately eighteen. Um, and I did find some sources that say I don't, I don't really care to source to cite this just because there's no documentation behind it. But he was hot tempered or hot headed. That's from basically hearsay because mm-hmm. uh, I, I can't corroborate that with anything well and that's too that kind of like leads to my theory where you're saying yes yeah, she would she wouldn't leave her stuff behind but knowing people who have been in, in abusive relationships and knowing people who have been in like those type of relationships he could have showed up and said either you get in this car right fucking now or i'm gonna leave your ass and that could have been why she got in the car and left all of her stuff behind. I think she knew. She still wouldn't have left your purse. I I don't know. She wouldn't have. I have had somebody say, get in the car right half an hour. I'm going to leave your ass. And I go, fine, let me get my purse. Yeah, but I mean, she could, I mean, she could have just been, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I know you said nobody leave her purse, but I think it just depends on the person. It depends on the situation. I think that she knew who it was. She knew who her assailant was. And I think that she was coaxed into going with them and leaving her stuff behind. Just like, hey, we're going to be back. Just leave your stuff or get in the car right fucking now or we're or I'm just going to leave you here. I think it's one of those two. I think, she got, I think she got pulled into the car. I think she mm-hmm. decided she didn't want to go with them and she got pulled into the car. That, that, that's a possibility as well. Could happen as well. Because she ain't leaving her purse. That's that's my hang up. She's not leaving her purse. She's too put together of a girl. Yeah. She would she would and, not go to her. And I will say, Ryan, we are both men. We have never had to carry purses in our life. You never had to haul a tampon like. shoved in your bra because you forgot your purse. Yeah, we you're not gonna forget your purse. I don't you know, know what it, but we, hold on. <laughs> yeah, how do you know, Shelly? Um <laughs> We don't, we don't know what it's like, you know, obviously to, yeah. have to have a purse in tow. But let me tell you something. Out of all the people that are watching, all the girls that are commenting right now, every single one of them has basically said women would not leave their purse. Thank you, ladies. Okay. Thank so, you, ladies. You're exactly I'm, right. I'm going to go with, with Shelly on that. Okay. Um, we so. do not willingly leave our purse because that has everything we potentially need. And you got to remember back then, 
there were pay phones. There weren't cell phones. She had to have mm -hmm. some change. Even if she took off walking to a pay phone because she couldn't get anybody else on the phone, she would have to have change. Mm -hmm. She's yeah. not leaving her purse. She's yeah. just not, it's not okay. happening. Yeah. So we get to the next little bit of what I like to classify as like the ongoing investigation. So from January 5th to February the 8th, obviously there's multiple news articles coming out about Kelly Wilson. She's banished. She's missing uh, all the details of the nights about leading up to her disappearance and the, the flat tire and yada, yada. All of that that we just talked about is being repeated over and over and over again. Their search is being uh, put together. They do searches on February 9th, February 29th. Um, they do one 900 acre track, one 300 acre track. Nothing's found on the 900 acre track. On the 300 acre track, though, the lead investigator, Sergeant James Brown, he comes back and he is quoted as saying, quote, proved helpful to the investigation and, quote, gave more insight to the investigation that this was a high priority area. However, hmm. there is no further mention of this place. And I looked endlessly about what came up, what was found. I mean, I even sent in a private hmm. citizen request to the city of Gilmer itself for the police files on this that they could give away for public knowledge. Uh, I didn't get it in time, so hopefully it'll come in after this podcast, but is what it is. Um, but there was never any mention of it again about what they found. Um, so I find that very interesting. Hmm. Um, or now, maybe it was never mentioned again because they found nothing. Maybe that was just the area that they got some kind of tip. We need to go look. It was high priority because maybe this is where everybody was supposed to be. Now I'm going to tell you right now, you want to know what the deal was with Kelly Whistle and her boyfriend? Why didn't anyone interview her best friend? You know she had a best friend, and you know as well as I do. Because y'all got best friends, y'all tell all your business too. Girls got a best friend, we tell our bit. Even if it's embarrassing stuff, there's that one person mm -hmm. that we will tell all our business to. Because, you know, when we go, oh, yeah, girl, screw him. You don't need that asshole. We tell all our business. <laughs> Why did nobody ever seek out Kelly Wilson's best friend to talk to her? That's because a very that good chick would have known what was going on with her best friend. And yeah. that is something that appears to be wildly overlooked. That would have been the first place I went. Who's her best friend? Whose party was she going to? Yeah. We, I've, and, and I, Blake, you looked at it. I looked at it. I read over 500 and something articles. And I read never articles, saw yeah. where they, yep, we read the same articles. I never found anything that said that they interviewed her best friend. Yeah, I didn't either. I didn't either. Now, I mean, the only thing that I was able to find is as the investigation goes on in different news articles as they come out, you know, this news article says, okay, we've interviewed 50 people. Then like two weeks later, it's now 75 people. Two weeks later, it's now 100 people. I don't know if her best friend is lumped in to those interviews and stuff like that. They could if have If they been. were, they would no have idea. said it. But she's never mentioned. She's hmm. never mentioned. If they would only, have interviewed only, her best friend, they would have said it. Only to the effect of she never made her scheduled meeting with her best friend later that night. Hmm. So we get the searches going. One of them proves to be good for the investigation, stuff like that. Then we get to April 24th, 1992. And this is where Michael Bybee, who becomes suspect number three at this point, is arrested in connection to tire slashing of Kelly Wilson's back left uh, tire. That is what was wrong with, with the the flat ever car. Now, you would think that this is the break that they need. This is the lead that they've been waiting for and all this stuff. So it's not. Michael Bybee is 17 to 18 years old at this time. And sources say that he's a Gilmer High School dropout. Um, he is said to have been casual acquaintances with Kelly Wilson through school. Uh, he admitted to slashing her tire. Um, but here, the kicker, as Shelly said earlier, the week prior to her disappearance, in the same parking lot, at the same store, there were other tires being slashed, um, and he was the one. He pled guilty to the tire slashing for Kelly Wilson's car. He's arrested. He's charged with a misdemeanor uh, charge of criminal mischief and released on a $1,500 bond uh, for the slashing. So my determination of it, basically a punk kid, wrong place, wrong time. He just being a little shit. That's all. Yeah. That's just being a little hoodlum. <laughs> yeah. Wanting yeah. to make some mischief. Thinks this is funny. Mm -hmm. Probably was watching people walk out going, shit, I got a flat tire. Probably, you know, I mean, we Absolutely. can if and and all day long, but he had done it before. It, it was yeah. like, that was his, that was, you know, some people, like know, arson, arsonist sets fires, he slashes tires. Okay. So yeah. it's like, that's yeah. what his type of criminal mischief was that he enjoyed doing. So. Yeah. 
So we get him taken care of. He's now on the suspect list until we can figure out why did we slash the tire. Excuse me. There's nothing really. So, so the investigation in 1992 wasn't as uh, progressive as I really wanted it to be, like the way that I found out. Everything that I kept reading, there was very little that was found out in actual the year of 1992. Um, I mean, you go from April 24th all the way mm -hmm. to October 28th that there is no additional movement in this case. I mean, you're talking May, June, July, August, September, October, six months. And there's no movement forward in the case. We're going to say, Ryan, sorry. I was going to say, correct me if I'm wrong, though. James Brown, the police chief, was obsessed with solving this case, correct? Like no, he's, he, not, he's, he's not the police chief. He's just okay. a sergeant. Okay. Well, um, he was obsessed with solving this case, though, to the point was. where he was taking time even on his vacations to look for her, right? He raised yes. the money to put up mm -hmm. a billboard to find this girl. This was a good cop. This was yeah. the cop you wanted working yeah. on your child's case. This was a good man. So, but even through 1992, he doesn't find much. He does not find much because what they're realizing is that if there are any witnesses, if there are anybody who is tied to the case who could corroborate things, they're not talking. They're not saying much. Mm -hmm. um, so, like I said, from April 25th all the way to October 28th, you don't really have much that's progressing the case forward. You do have a news article that came out seven months after her disappearance. This is basically, it's entitled The Agony of Uncertainty. And it's her parents being interviewed. And, and trust me, it is absolutely heartbreaking to read. I mean, it talks about her mother having to pack up all of Kelly's personal belongings because she can't even look at them anymore. Um, you know, that the, the car that she was driving has been sitting in their driveway, um, never to be driven again. Um, it's just, I don't know. And, and her mother at this point is saying, she's quoted as saying, I never felt she was alive. Um, her father via her stepmother is also quoted as the same thing. Um, and so, and Sergeant Brown at that time also says he's having a hard time keeping the focus of Kelly with the community. Mm -hmm. So it's, I don't know. It's, it's, there's just not much that's happening during that time to, to progress things forward. Now you get to October 28th, 1992. Um, Sergeant Brown does hold a news conference, which he does say we're gaining some ground. It's slow ground, but we're going to stay after. So I'm sure I'm taking that as he's interviewing people and all that stuff. Now, what's interesting is two days later on October 30th, Chris Denton, the then boyfriend of Kelly, or on again, off again, boyfriend of Kelly Wilson, uh, is arrested in connection to a stabbing that he does plead guilty to. Oh, shit. And serves his time, pays his fine, and is put on a 10-year probation for it. And I find that very interesting fact. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people have asked me, do you think you that he has it in him? Look at his criminal record. Look oh, what yeah. he admits to and pleads guilty to. He pled guilty to stabbing somebody in October on October 20th, 30th of 1992. So you better believe if I didn't stab anybody, I'm be going, hell no, I didn't stab nobody. Mm -hmm. But he's going guilty. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when the the billboard at that time in October as well is is donated you know, by the, the sergeant um, to help raise awareness and give uh, a reward for any tips. So, and that's literally the end of 1992. That's from her disappearance all the way to the end of December of 1992. Um, so basically just a summary of it. Kelly goes missing, cars abandoned, unlocked, person glasses are, in fine, or are inside, only the keys are missing and the back left tire, uh, back driver's side tire is slashed. Gosh, words are hard, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> You have your suspects, Joe Henry, uh, Chris Denton, Michael Bybee. Joe Henry is cleared very on, uh, very early on. Uh, you have your searches done that helped the case, supposedly. Michael Bybee's arrested, and Chris Denton's arrested uh, in connection with the stabbing. That's all that takes place in 1992. So there mm -hmm. you have the first year of her disappearance. Yeah. Wow. That's all. That's it. And we're we're no we're nowhere closer to figuring out where she's at than we were the than we were that year. first year. Wow! Yeah. So because I know Blake, you're coming to this. This is the part that frustrated me to no end when we were digging through it. The distraction. Oh, not yet. We still got one more year to go through. That's very, very oh very, another year before very, the distraction. Yeah. Oh Lord, <laughs> that, have that, mercy. that does evolve a little bit of the case. So. January 1993, having no leads, no nothing like that, at the family's request, the Gilmer Police Department decide to hire and bring in a psychic. 
Now, a psychic's name is Noreen Rainier from Maitland, Florida. She's been okay. featured on like 48 Hours and all this stuff. Um, she has sent some of Kelly's personal effects, and she comes back and says, look, uh, Kelly's dead. That's what she says. Uh, and unfortunately, she suffered extreme pain. Um, and here's some drawings of the people who I have seen who did this. But she could not give any details about the whereabouts of Kelly's body or mm. Kelly's remains or anything like that. Now, or, I found this fascinating, Blake. <laughs> Whenever we Blake pulls up and I'm reading this article and I said, look, this psychic drew pictures of who did it. Interestingly enough to me, one looks like Joe Henry and one looks just like Chris Denton. Did you see Ron, this on the murder board? Michael, Ryan. Michael, Michael Bybee. Michael Bybee, Mike, excuse Mike, me. Michael okay. Bybee. Yeah. Michael Bybee. Okay. Would she have seen their mugshots before she... They weren't arrested. There would have been no public mugshot of them. Uh, Joe oh, was... I, Joe, you know, I guess you're Joe right. Was, Joe was not arrested. Now, Michael Bybee was. But back then, you don't have the internet. You do, yeah, you it wasn't like you could go and Google. Yeah. You would have yeah. to have watched the okay. 6 o'clock news. Yeah, or exactly. like, whatever. I wonder, I wonder, though... And she wasn't, she was from was another state, correct? She was from, she, uh, the psychic. Uh-huh. She was from Florida. Yes. Okay. So see, yeah. she, she ain't going to get all East Texas K-E-T-K no. weekend. Look at me. But was she, that. but was she briefed beforehand too, though? That's the thing. Like, was she like, sat I don't down know. And said, Hey, here's what we have. Can you tell us? And we don't know. I have no idea. I couldn't find any. I know. But I know. I'll tell, her, I'll tell I know. you the sketches that she drew. Mm-hmm. They bear a very strong resemblance to two of the four alleged suspects. I, I understand, but the, the thing that I'm saying though is, if, but if she was brief, that's the only thing I'm just like, I don't know. I mean, being yeah. briefed that's... and seeing visuals are two completely different things, though. But while she was being brief, she could have been shown a visual of like, this is who we have, this is what we're thinking, and like, could you tell us anything more about this? She may not have been. And if she wasn't, that is very impressive, but we don't know. So yeah. since we don't know, I got to chalk that up to being. I know I'm, you skeptic, know? I'm sus. I'm skeptic of all psychics too. Mm -hmm. Trust me. If I want to tell me some, I'm not going to give them nothing. I go talk. Mm -hmm. Tell yeah. me what you know. <laughs> yeah. you know. So then uh, around January of 20th, January 20th of 1993, this is where it kind of gets a little interesting. Michael Bybee tells police that he was abducted and assaulted. By two men who forced him into a car, repeatedly beat him with their fist uh, across uh, across his head, and then took him north of Gilmer and put him out on 270 Run around uh, uh, the Betty community. And this is investigated, but nothing that I could find ever actually came from it. Police actually huh. do investigate it. They were asking him about Kelly Wilson's disappearance, the case, why he slashed the tire, all that kind of stuff, while repeatedly beating the crap out of him, basically. Um, and hmm. it did say, I did find an article that said that he walked into the police station with a black eye and a busted lip or something along that lines. So, but it was never followed up on. It was investigated, but nothing ever came of it hmm. that I could find. That Allegedly, could find. he did not know his attackers, correct? Correct. Allegedly, he did not know them. So if you can't, if I, if I can't tell the policeman who did it and I've just had the hell beat out of me, I'd be like, I don't know who these dudes were. What's going to yeah. come of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then we get to March for uh, May fourth of nineteen ninety three. So now we are close to a year and a half later after Kelly's disappearance. Um, with uh, the police basically decide, hey, we don't feel like people are telling us the truth. The witnesses are telling us the truth. We're going to impanel a grand jury, bring these witnesses forth before the grand jury, so that the grand jury can hear the testimony of the witnesses and begin investigating this case as well to see if we have anything. Because basically, the chief of police at the time, McAllister, was said, look. They can come before the jury and tell the truth or they can plead the fifth. That's all that they can do because they're going to mm. be under oath at that point. So this is where it kind of gets a little weird and interesting. On May 7th and May 21st, two separate days, one person is called to testify for the grand jury, and that is Brent Ward. Brent Ward becomes suspect number four. Brent Ward is a little bit of an enigma in this case. There is not much that is truly known about him other than the fact that uh, he was approximately 18 at the time, and he's first cousins with Chris Denton. That's all that's known about him okay. that I could find. Now, he goes before the grand jury on both of these days and tells them the same thing twice. He told the grand jury he was at work in Holly Lake Ranch until 4 p.m. on the day that she vanished. 
He picked Chris Denton up in his pickup truck to go get hamburgers. He knew nothing about the disappearance of Kelly Wilson. Uh, and that he went and he dropped off Kristen at home at eight o'clock and then went on about his night, basically. So that that is his testament. Now, hang with me for just a second. That's his testament. I'm going to put those mm -hmm. facts out there real quick. June 4th comes back. Grand jury returns sealed indictments. Um, there is a search at this time ongoing. There's a search done on a tract of land um, that they had a tip on where bones were found. They sent the bones off to a pathologist. They came back. They were animal bones. So after that, on June 18th, Brent Ward is in the indictments. He is indicted on aggravated perjury charges. Now, what these say is that he turns himself in on June the 18th. He's released on $10,000 bond. What these indictments say is he lied about his whereabouts on the day that Kelly Wilson vanished. He was at work, as he said, till 4 p.m. in Holly Lake Ranch. And that's for both days. Both indictments are for that. Okay, follow me here. Um, the timesheet showed that he was not at work. And they did call two witnesses for it, and they said, oh, the timesheets aren't really reliable, but they couldn't corroborate this claim, and so they basically kind of tossed that testimony out, so to speak. Supervisor testified that Ward comes to him and says, look, if the FBI mm -hmm. or Gilmer police come asking you questions, you need to cover for me. I was at work with y'all this weekend. Dumbass. Yeah. <laughs> And another co another coworker that overhears this statement corroborates this claim of the supervisor being told, "Hey, need, need help covering this up." Now, part not part of the indictment, but part of the statement that came out with that is that he falsely told the grand jury he was in a pickup truck with someone that could only be identified as Chris Denton. Um, apparently, his truck was in the auto shop on January fifth, nineteen ninety two, and that there was mm -hmm. another witness that came forward to the grand jury that said that they saw Chris Denton and Brent Ward in a car. And I'm just going to say, for the record, and noted, Chris Denton owned a 1984 Chevrolet uh, uh, Chevrolet celebrity that was purchased on August 29th of 91, sold February the 11th of 1992 to a dealer in Louisiana to be shipped to Mexico. <laughs> and they F didn't follow up this. They didn't follow up on this. FBI goes to Mexico, finds the car, brings mm -hmm. the car back vacuums the car they find debris as well as hair strands and that the trunk mat is missing now benefit of the doubt kelly's his girlfriend kelly could be in the car kelly could have left debris in the car all this you know blah blah blah. it would not be unusual to find pieces of her hair i shed like a dog i mean if, exactly. if, if i go missing they're coming to y'all and y'all they're gonna find a piece of my hair in y'all car if i've ever ridden <laughs> yeah. with you but I'm sorry, but it just seems so freaking suspicious to me that you sell your yeah. car a month after she goes missing and your trunk mat is supposed to be missing. Now, granted, trunk mat could go missing in transit. The dealer that he sold it to could have thrown it out. But to stuff. Mexico, across like international borders, that I don't know, man. Well, Some, now, now in all fairness, right. he isn't going to know what the dealer does with it once the dealer buys it. Okay. He yeah. sells it, but he leaves the state of Texas to sell it. Mm -hmm. That's suspect. That's yeah. very suspect. And that quickly after the murder or that's whatever. suspect murder, as well. But disappearance, you know, like that is very, that's very suspect. That's very fishy. Now, now let's give a little credit to the Gilmer Police Department right here, because it was the Sergeant, Sergeant Brown, who asked for the FBI to come in and help yes. them with this. It was him. And mm -hmm. he wanted their help because there mm -hmm. wasn't a lot of movement in the case. And he wanted, because he he was going off, it was an abduction, and she's under 18, so it is technically a missing child. Yes. Mm -hmm. So let's give him credit. He did bring them in and and did want them. He, and he talked mm -hmm. McAllister into it, and they, uh, they brought in the FBI. Yeah. So that's all, that's all, all found out in these indictments, basically, so to speak. Um, August 27th, 1993. Grand jury returns more indictments. This time, August 31st, 1993, Brent Ward is arraigned on another aggravated perjury charge. Released on a $15,000 bond, and it alleges that Ward lied to the grand jury by denying he asked a friend, some sources say then-girlfriend, Mandy Kramer, to, quote, help him develop an alibi for January 5th of 1992. And, and I'm talking when, when I hold on now, when I, when I I'm going to pause right here and let you know where the source, sources are coming from on this. This is not a hearsay 
source. This is not a newspaper article. These I literally pulled up Ward versus the state of Texas, where he went to appeal his conviction for his perjury charges. Mm -hmm. Um, And I read through the entirety of the entire lawsuit. And that is where this this poor little section is coming from. It's from Mm -hmm. the Texas government and the lawsuit that took place of the appeals court of the Fifth Circuit when he appealed his conviction for his perjury charges. Go Mm -hmm. ahead. No, I was, I was going uh, to ask, uh, because in some of the research that I did, I found that he said that that they had stopped by the video store to mess with mess around with Kelly Day before she disappeared, that was, wasn't that? that? That was supposedly in the statement to his supervisor. I couldn't corroborate it with anything, so I kind of left mm-hmm. that out. But supposedly to his supervisor, yes, he did say, because we were, quote, in the video store 15 minutes prior to its close, and we were messing with her. I don't know what messing with her means. I don't, there was no elaboration. But however, Joe Henry never makes a statement that he sees them in the video store. Because trust me, if I was the last person to see somebody live, I'd be like, oh, well, you know what? Right before we closed, these two, her boyfriend came in, they were aggravating Mm -hmm. her, they were doing all this. And and I just assumed that she went with them. I would have pointed out, he never mentions that. So maybe, maybe they had, maybe she'd gone outside for a second. They drove by honking at her, you know, hey, I mean, who knows? It's small town. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but Joe Henry never states that they were in the video store and you would think that if that would have taken suspicion off of him and it would have actually happened that he would have said something, Man, he would have said something but to be arraigned on perjury, what, th- what, three different times? Is that where we're at now? Right, right now? Yeah. He's facing three perjury charges at this moment to be arraigned on perjury three different times to be indicted. Caught, mm-hmm. Yeah. To be caught talking to his boss saying hey you need to tell them that i was here and i wasn't there on this particular date <laughs> something i mean come on yep. there you go right there yeah but he, he said so, that he, he did knows. that because he was he was worried that he was going to get tangled up in it and he said i didn't have anything to do with it and i just don't want to even be part of it i want everybody to keep me out of it but you can see it both ways the lady the you ever heard the phrase the lady doth protest too much no. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like basically it means like, you know, you're making a big deal about this to not be involved pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're, you know, you're, you're turning them, you're turning a mountain into a molehill. Do you know something? You know what I mean? Like right, you're yeah. trying your best. If you didn't, if you had nothing to do with this and you don't want to be involved. Why are you there? For, why, why are you then involving yourself? Why are you going to such coming up with an alibi to become and uninvolved? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> after that, um, sorry, a month later, all of his charges for aggravated perjury are completely dropped because his lawyers come forward and his lawyers say, "Look, Texas, uh, Texas Department or Texas Code of Criminal Procedure twenty one point one four, you cannot indict." The same jury who heard the testimony cannot indict somebody on perjury, which is true. It is the Mm -hmm. code for for, uh, criminal procedure. So they go, okay. I could not find if another grand jury was impaneled or what. But anyways, October 25th, 1993, he's re-indicted on aggravated perjury. They're like, okay, we're going to drop him. But hey, guess what? We're going to re-indict you. Um, It's the same charges. (laughs) It's the same charges as before. But Mm -hmm. in my opinion, it's got to be a different grand jury, obviously. uh, he was not rearrested, and the bonds were just kind of slid over to these. So he's mm. just basically facing the same charges. Um, so I found all that kind of interesting. And then the the way that they round out uh, December the first, nineteen ninety three, is that Michael Bybee is sentenced for the tire slashing incident. He receives ninety days and a five hundred dollar fine. Um, some did get very upset with him at that point uh, and his attorneys because a lot of think that he should receive the maximum. I'm going to say that. I do believe that he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was just some punk kid trying to, you know, his MO was slashing tires. But mm-hmm. I do not believe that his actions were foreseeable to the circumstances that were to come. Now, do I think that he should, in some part, take a little bit of blame for what happened to Kelly Wilson? I would say yes, because had he not slashed her tires, she would not have been in the predicament that she was in. But he is serving jail time and he's paying a fine for it. So that's mm-hmm. what the jury found him liable for. You know, he probably feels absolutely awful about it, too. I'm sure. You know, because they said he was an acquaintance. And yes. yes. 
he you was know, the catalyst that set up the string of events. Just by yeah. him doing stupid Deciding shit. Deciding to be a little hoodlum. Yeah. He inadvertently caused his friend yes. to disappear. And, and and I have read articles where it does say that he is very remorseful, uh, that he was in court looking remorseful. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. I just don't have anything else that it all leads to. He's just he was a punk kid at the time and just yeah. doing stupid shit and should have been place. Doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Blake, let's let's say this. Uh, he he is still alive, correct? Uh, as far as I know. Okay. Yes, as far as we know, because we actually, Blake and I endeavored to find him that night to see if there was a way that we could contact him. He is very well covered. He is. He is extremely difficult to find. Yeah, very. very. Uh, I'm almost under uh, of the train of thought that he may have changed his name. Uh, that's how That's how difficult, whenever you can't find any public records anywhere, uh, Facebook, you can't find, you know, you go to, to find a person, you can't find them. I'm under the assumption he very well may have changed his name. Uh, I don't know that. That is my assumption being that he was so difficult to find if he is still living. And we aren't certain whether he is or he isn't. Correct. But I'll tell you this, we could not find him in doing a massive deep dive search. Uh, I got off on a rabbit hole while Blake was off running another rabbit hole. And I'm like, I'm going to find this asshole. We're going to talk to him. We're going to figure out a way to, we're going to ask real nice and we're going to talk to him. Yeah. He obviously does not want to be found. And I'm not encouraging anyone to go find him. Leave the man alone. No, absolutely. Leave the man alone. He has nothing to do with this case. He's cleared from the suspect board 100%. Yes. In my opinion. Um, he had nothing to do with it. He's just wrong place, wrong time, and a punk kid at the time. So, yeah. That wraps up the end of year two. And now, <laughs> To get to the next portion, I've got to do a little bit of backtracking to bring you into, because some of the details about this next section play into the fact of how these two paths of these two cases met and were completely intertwined from there on out. And I'm going to do my best to unintertwine them. I don't know what the word is, but anyways. Hang on and pay attention because this is, has, as Blake said, more turns than a country road. Yeah. So. We are in Jan- so we, we we leave off in January of 1994. Now, in order to understand this, you got to understand what's happening in the country at this time, starting in the 1980s and extending to the world by the late 1990s and even to this day, there is a term that is taking place in the country called satanic panic. Mm-hmm. We three know what that is, but for the viewers that do not know what that is, um, this started with the publication of a book called Michelle Remembers when she, with her psychologist turned husband. Um, does uh, memory recovery or recovered memory theory that makes sweeping lurid claims about satanic ritual abuse involving her. Um, And then that just rose to a mass hysteria panic throughout the United States. Um, And the most extreme forwards of these allegations involves a conspiracy, a global satanic cult that includes the wealthy and world powerful elite in which children are abducted or bred for human sacrifices, pornography Mm -hmm. and prostitution. That is by definition, the worst case of satanic panic. This leads to 12,000 reports of satanic ritual abuse throughout the United States, all of which could not could, uh, investigators could not substantiate any of the claims. No. And that also led to a lot of missing persons cases being tied to some kind of satanic cult. Mm-hmm. Yes. And unfortunately, this case became a victim of that as well. Yes, it did. So we move backwards in time real quick. We left off at January 1994. We've got to go back real quick to a a local family in the Gilmer area. Uh, There's the the Kerr family. Uh, A little bit about them. Yes, sources say, I'm just going to leave it at the sources say that they were a family that was easy to make rumors about. We we all know what we're talking about at that point. I will not repeat any of the things that actual officials said on record about them because I find it very distasteful of some of the things that they said. Mm -hmm. Um, The key players in this familial breakdown, you have Eugene and Geneva Kerr, patriarch and matriarch. You have Wendell and Danny, their sons. You have Wanda Kerr. She is the wife of Wendell. Loretta Kerr is Wendell's ex-wife. I'm just doing a quick rundown for you. Connie Sue Martin is Danny's, the son's, common-law wife. Lucas Gear is Wanda's brother. Roger Don Holman is a reserve police officer, and Tammy Jo Smith is Roger Holman's girlfriend. 
that's encompassing. If you need to learn it and you're watching us later, just rewind just a little bit and listen to that part again. <laughs> um, so this starts November of 1990. 1990, a representative from the Texas Department of Human Services, Ann Gore, is placed on a case involving Wendell Kerr and Loretta Kerr uh, for child abuse charges, uh, sexual abuse charges, allegations, not charges, sorry, sexual abuse allegations against Wendell Kerr. Uh, and it's Gore's responsibility to go and visit with these children. Uh, in December of 1990, Gore is shown a letter that is addressed to Wendell Kerr from Lucas Gear. And basically, Lucas Gear is writing and says, hey, I'm sorry I sexually abused one of Wanda's children. His then wife, not his ex-wife, but his then wife. Mm -hmm. uh, and, Lu and, and Lucas goes and admits this to the authorities. Uh, Wendell and Loretta are administered polygraphs about sexual abuse. He fails, she passes. I don't know what the questions were. I don't know how it came out. But in moving forward, I'm going to try and move relatively quickly to get us back to January 1994. In May of 1991, Wendell Kerr is indicted on sexual abuse charges, and they discover that Wendell and Wanda are now living together. So Wendell's children, the Kerr children, I'm going to refer to as the Kerr children, are already removed out of the home and put into foster care. Now that they are married, the Hicks children, which are Wanda Hicks's children, are taken out, put into foster care. Totaling nine children at this point. There's another caseworker that's involved, Debbie Minshew. She's also a state representative with the Texas Department of Human Services at this time. She has put on the most troubled cases of these nine children. Okay, so you have Ann Gore and Debbie Minshew that are working this case. Um, it's at this time that the Kerr and the Hicks children both began very elaborate stories of sexual molestation, sodomization at the hands of their parents, their grandparents, and even strangers. Uh, they started telling about blood, the devil, mask, knives, all in connection with the abuse. Uh, and they even told graphically of, and I apologize, disclaimer, if any of this is a weak stomach for anybody. They also told graphically of the dismemberment of babies and children. Um, so the prosecution moves forward on the curves at this point, Wendell and Wanda. However, it ends up getting dropped because... Gore and Minshew, the two state representatives, are mishandling the child witnesses by using what they call the holding technique, which basically they hold a child against their will until they tell them what they want to hear. The fuck? Yeah, it, it was a uh, it was deemed you don't basically do that shit. Uh, no. Yeah, I would say not. <laughs> yeah. And as best as the record is say, this was done by the foster parents until the children would repeat for Gore and Minshew what was said uh, about the sexual abuse allegations. Um, and then you have a lot of things that kind of happen back and back towards the end of 1991. Uh, Wanda does admit to sexual abuse. Her children until, again tell Gore of what appears to be ritual child abuse. Uh, the foster mother of these children tells CPS how the children said Wendell brought the kids to the woods, left them telling them, quote, the devil is coming. The Hicks children tell Gore of their bone collection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that you found that. Mm -hmm. And that rolls into January of 92. Where this kid basically is saying, one of the boys is saying, I collect bones, I collect people's bones, and all kinds of bones, animal bones, and people. Uh, and he's told how he was taught to keep the bones. Mm -hmm. um, that's how all these other people get tied in at this point. The other people, Roger Holman, Tammy Jo Smith, Eugene and Geneva Kerr, Wanda Kerr, and Lucas Gear are all mentioned as people and connected to the sexual abuse allegations. Um and then uh, they tell of a bunch of other just very disturbing and graphing about how they're cut and the blood is put into a pot. Um, they're they're they drink from this pot. They call it a devil's pot, right? A devil's it's, pot. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If yes. you just really want to know all those terrible things that the kids say they were put through, go and read it. It's that's yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, a lot that, of I, I can't stuff hang that, with hearing yeah. it all. So yeah. Blake's kindly not, agreed to leave some of that out. Yes. Mm -hmm. So. Um, <laughs> and I do have to stop here and say that other than Wanda breaking down on the court and admitting to some of the sexual abuse allegations, there's nothing to corroborate any of these things. Yeah, there's no there's no missing people. There's no missing women. There's no missing children. Uh, you know, yeah, if I all mean, these babies truly went mm -hmm. missing for sacrifices, why did anybody call and say, hey, my baby's missing? Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. You know, like we, we had talked about it, I guess it was a couple nights ago, like with the whole satanic panic thing. These kids think about this like in, in this particular time period, you know, 2020 is on and Dateline and all this stuff is on and everything has to do. And the Barbara with some, Walter special. Yeah, all the yeah, all these yes. specials have something to do with like our Satanists controlling your children and and all this stuff. And so they're seeing all this stuff. 
And when they go and they have to speak to an adult with authority, they're relaying all these stories that they think they want to hear. Yep. And they're telling them, oh, yeah, well, I have a bone collection and mom and dad sacrificed babies to Satan. And it's like, that's not necessarily the case. It's just these kids are regurgitating what they're seeing and yeah. what they think the adults want to hear. Yeah. And, and we did get talking mm -hmm. about this because, you know, and, and these kids may genuinely mm -hmm. think that they remember that yeah. because as we were talking about, mm -hmm. that's whenever like, you know, your mother will tell you or somebody in your family will tell you, oh, yeah, whenever you were four, you did this or when you were five, you did this. And the first time you hear it, you're like, I don't remember doing that. And then you hear it told mm -hmm. again and you're like, oh, yeah, I did that. And then whenever it comes to you tell a story, you're like, oh, yeah, you know, when I was five, I remember. Mm -hmm. Well, no, you don't. You just heard it so mm -hmm. many times that you think that you remember and yeah. if these kids had seen a lot of this graphic television, obviously they weren't really mm -hmm. well supervised or they were overly supervised, or maybe they used their televisions to escape from their horrible home life situation. And perhaps with that inundation of all of the, mm -hmm. again, the satanic panic, that just seems like such a broad brush to brush over how truly awful a lot of it was. Um, that is ingrained in their psyche. Exactly. That's, if they wanted to live in their own little fantasy land, as a lot of kids do, and have their own mm -hmm. little, you know, uh, imaginary friends in their own little magical worlds mm -hmm. and playing this and that, I can see if that's what you saw on TV every day. Maybe we're going to play, oh, I'm the devil. I mean, yeah. And there are people who were sitting in prison to this day because of something little Timmy said that could not be corroborated when mm -hmm. it comes to this sort of thing. I mean, like, I mean, probably the most famous example other than this, like look at the West Memphis Three. Look at how long they sat in prison just because of the somebody whole satanic said. panic. And somebody yeah. said, we think this happened and we thought we saw them do this. You know, I mean, it's it's insane. I'm th thankfully, we don't have to deal. I mean, I'm, I guess I would say we don't have to deal with that anymore. But in the 90s and 80s and 70s, it was very prominent. Yeah, yeah. Mm hmm. So then we get to January 5th, 1992. Obviously, Kelly Wilson disappears at this point. Uh, in that same month, Danny Kerr now receives allegations mm -hmm. of child abuse when he and his common law, law wife, Connie Martin, at that point, separate. When this comes into play, the Kerr and Martin children are now removed and put into foster, foster care. And I think at this point, we're somewhere between the, 50, the, the numbers of 15 and 16 children have now been mm -hmm. removed from these households and put into foster care. Um, <clears throat> The Kerr and Martin children, though, are the ones that go and say, hey, but there's this other kid, and since he was a minor at the time, I will leave his name out of it, uh, that has suffered the same abuse as us. Uh, and so then that gets pulled into it. And I believe, if I remember correctly, I didn't have any further story on him, but I do believe that he is plucked out, or their children are plucked out and put into foster care as well. Um, then you go on through... Basically, all of 1992, where you have some of them, Wendell Kerr admitting to indecency with a child, um, Wanda and Wendell, both are relinquishing their parental rights to their children. Um, and then the Hicks children tell their foster mother, again, of ritual abuse. Wendell Kerr sent to 10-year probation. But then you get two other individuals that are pulled into this whole thing, and that is uh, Gordon Minshew's a supervisor brought on two people named Steve uh, Stephen Bags, who's an investigator for the Criminal Law Enforcement Division of the Texas Department of Public Safety, uh, and you also have Brooks Fleek. He is a Louisiana police officer. Now, both of these guys are self-described as basically ritual abuse experts and occult <laughs> uh, cult crime experts. They couldn't so, get Ed and Lorraine Warren. <laughs> <laughs> now, I can tell you that there are people who are experts on the occult there are but anyone who conflates that with law enforcement and puts that together not necessarily a good thing yeah because i mean like i said once again we saw that in the west memphis three case when someone claimed that they were a expert on the occult and they got their degree. They said they were a PhD in these things and they got a, de a degree from like a degree mill. They just like mailed it in and got a PhD degree from people. Yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, so don't, Is it don't just trust that easy. Me. It's that easy. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I'm an so then, expert then too. <laughs> so then you have, <laughs> right. You have uh, the Hicks children are taken to Austin DPS by Debbie Minshew. They're interviewed by uh, Bags and Fleeg. Mm -hmm. um, and Wanda, at this point, she gave up her parental rights, but she's pregnant. She's refusing to give up her parental rights to her unborn child. 
However, this is the part that I really don't mm -hmm. care or agree with. It says that she's threatened with ritual abuse investigation, where within 24 hours, she relinquishes her rights to her unborn child. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's absolutely disgusting. I'm sorry. But anyways, um, two of the Kerr children have been interviewed by Bags and Flea. All of this basically comes into play at around February of 1993. Um, all these allegations are going on for this whole past year in 1992. February of 1993, Lucas Gear, Wanda's brother, comes back and he says, yes, I was part of a group that sacrificed babies and the sexual assaults of the children. And it's almost like he he glosses over, he just basically kind of in passing was like, oh yeah, and Kelly Wilson, and just goes this other way. It just glosses over it. This is the first time Kelly's name is brought up in connection to the Kerr family. Um, he's administered a polygraph test, which he does pass. He is he is actually tested by Ernie Holsey of Houston, who's considered like a legend in his field, mm -hmm. and he cannot find no deception in gears admission to this uh and then in may of 1993 that's when all the indictments are brought about uh for all the individuals in this child molestation case so we're not going to go into the crazy details you want to read up on more of the crazy details about that case moving forward you're more than welcome to go and research that um additional searches are done children go to testify just giving you very pinpoint stuff here because i'm trying to get us back to january of 1994. um basically i want to take us to November 8th of 1993, November 7th, I'm sorry. This is where it gets really interesting to me because this is where kind of shit starts to go freaking downhill. Under the care of the foster children's, I'll leave their names out of it, one of the children is critically injured and hospitalized. When confronted about child abuse, the foster father says he, he fell running up and down the stairs, to which others say, yeah, that's how he punishes his foster children. That's on February 7th. On February 8th, the foster father commits suicide by gunshot. On February, I mean, not February, November 8th, sorry, he commits suicide by gunshot. On November mm -hmm. 10th, the foster mother commits suicide by overdose. So these kids are dealing with all of this allegations of sexual abuse. They get put into these foster homes, and the foster mother and father both commit suicide. And this is where everything okay. begins to snowball and bring us back in December to January of 1994. You have so much crap that starts taking place in December of 1993, right before this Kelly Wilson disappearance case just completely freaking derails. Um, you've got polygraph stuff happening. People are failing polygraph tests. Probations are being revoked. People are put into the Upshur County Jail. Uh, Wanda Kerr and Connie Martin plead guilty and enter into a plea deal. Um, Basically, Wanda gives the information on Kelly Wilson, and this is where it starts to be divulged, that Kelly Wilson was taken back to Eugene and Geneva uh, Kerr's house as a birthday present. And she gives very graphic details about the actions taken against Kelly. Basically, she was sexually tortured, kept in a red shed for 10 days, and killed in a sacrificial sacrifice or ritual sacrifice. Um, she even went as far as to retrace the track, that they're, the route that they took to, to get to Kelly. So at this point, all of a sudden, the bonds are all raised for the Kerr family who are currently serving time. They're in jail for child molestation charges. Um, now, after this, they were also allowed constant contact in jail. That is documented. And uh, even sharing the same jails at the same time, which objections to this were ignored. So Wanda Kerr and... Connie Martin moved from one jail to the other, Harrison County Jail, and they start identifying all this stuff that they, they found in these searches. Oh, yeah, that's instrumentalities for torture and, and all of this stuff that we use on the victims and whatnot. Statements very disturbing, very graphic. I am not going to go into it. Um, but basically, Connie comes forward with her statement and says and implicates Eugene, Geneva, Wendell, Danny, Wanda, Roger Holt, a Kerr, all those are Kerrs, Roger Holman, Tammy Jo Smith, and herself. That they were all there, they were all present for Kelly's torture and ritual sacrifice. And in the same day, Wanda Kerr sends to her husband, Wendell, a letter that basically says, I've confessed, it's now time for you to confess. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just let me know. Yeah, this is where we're starting to snowball. 
Okay. Do we know if their lawyers were present? There was a lot of times that they were interviewed for a lot of these things and it is documented that most of the time their lawyers were not present. And they got to spend mm -hmm. time alone together without yes. a lawyer present. So they get their stories together. Yep. So Fleeg delivers the letter to Wendell upon which Wendell is ready to confess. However, he didn't have a lawyer. Not having a lawyer, they say, hey, you need a lawyer. His lawyer comes in and says, hey, don't say anything. You can never give him a statement. Um, and then all of a sudden, Connie Martin wanted to occur back to giving additional information on ritual killings and starting to corroborate all of this stuff and additional victims, additional searches, searches are done of additional residences where bones are found and all these things are taken into custody, but it's animal bones. There's supposed blood residue on mattress coverings, on shovels, on all this stuff, but none of this evidence that I could find was fully tested by a lab or corroborated further by other mm -hmm. witnesses other than Wanda and Connie. So that's where I start. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, this is just stupid at this point. Um, and Wendell Kerr, at the same time, gives an alibi. He says, dude, I was even out of the freaking state January 5th, 1992. I'm a trucker. I've got gas receipts. I've got mile logs. Uh, what do you want? You know, go get them. Uh, and then that's when, so so this other investor, Carlton Scott with Sergeant James Brown. Carlton Scott goes to Arkansas. He goes to his truck academy. He gets all those records. And it shows January 5th. They were not in town. Wendell and Wanda, I believe it's Wendell and Wanda. Yeah, Wendell and Wanda both were not in town. But Wanda's, tell, Wanda's telling all of this elaborate story about how she was present for the, the sexual torture and sacri ritual sacrifice of Kelly Wilson. So do you think she could potentially have been trying to say, hey, okay, I'm about to go away for child abuse, but if you'll give me immunity, guess what I know? That's what that sounds like to me. I'm actually going to touch on that just a little bit later. Oh, I'm sorry. That. I didn't mean to blow your back. No, 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 no. That's okay. That no. That's that absolutely if you okay. can't see that coming a mile away, holy cow. Yeah. 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 Because it, see, yeah, it just seems like they're trying to save their skin the best way they know how. Yeah. So, Connie Warren and Wanda Kerr both passed polygraph tests to their statements. Now, how they passed, both of them were surprised. I was even freaking surprised at this. I was like, wait, what? Again, like, they passed polygraphs are not admissible in court for a reason. I know. And initially, Sergeant Brown is not implicated in either one of their confessions. Now, from this a lawsuit, me off. this is the part that starts to piss me off, too. From a lawsuit that I found from that, uh, it was said in both Eugene and Geneva Kerr's appeal lawsuit and Brown's appeal lawsuit that they both did after all this was done, where they sued everybody. Um, Apparently, Sergeant Brown starts asking questions about why this special prosecutor that's been brought in, Scott Lyford. Uh, oh, from yeah, Galveston, let's talk about that asshole. We'll talk about him in just a second. <laughs> he, start, he starts talking about uh, asking questions about, dude, basically, why are you in the Kelly Wilson investigation? What the hell is going on? And he says, basically, essentially, hey, I, I'm taking over the Kelly Wilson case at this point. And he says, if you get in my way and it is quoted, he says, we're going to have a problem. This is prior to Connie Martin and Wanda Kerr's testimony and all this stuff. All of a sudden, that takes place. He's not implicated initially. The very next day, surprise, surprise. Guess what she remembers. Wow. Guess what, guess what Connie remembers? Ah, Sergeant Brown was there. That's right. And this poor man has taken all his time to see if he has can't find this poor girl. And has made raised this his money, priority. Made yeah, became obsessed, made this his priority. And now this new prosecutor wants to have a dick measuring competition. Oh, his name's Lifer. Let's make sure we say this asshole's name because he was he was profitable. He made quite a thing. This man, Lifer. Oh no. He about bankrupted Gilmer. Pretty damn close to it. Almost. And went down this rabbit hole that completely derailed this case and took all the focus off of finding a missing girl and decided they were going to go into the satanic panic and they were going to take down a good man, Sergeant Brown. You know what, Sergeant Brown? I'm going to apologize to you for anybody that ever thought that about you. I am sorry. I have read the evidence. I have looked at all the documentation. I will tell you right now, you got screwed, my friend, and I am sorry for the Absolutely. way you were treated. 100%. So this all culminates in leading us back to January of 1994, where we left off on the actual Kelly Wilson investigation, because all of a sudden, after all these confessions come forward and bam, Sergeant Brown is is implicated in the Kelly Wilson disappearance. Um, 
on January 21st, basically a freshly impaneled grand jury by Scott Lyford returns indictments. And those indicted are Eugene and Geneva, Kerr, Wendell Kerr, Danny Kerr, Wanda Kerr, Roger Holman, Tammy Jo Smith, and Sergeant James Brown. Connie avoided arrest due to her cooperation with the Lifer team. Hmm. Exactly. And it's you not don't until, say. And Guess what the, else I remember? And this, this is the other thing that kills me, is that it's not until after these indictments come out, two days later, another witness comes forward and says, oh yeah, I saw Sergeant Brown drinking coffee at Danny Kerr's house. And Eugene and Geneva Kerr's house. Why was that not said before? All of a sudden, we're waiting until after the indictments come out, and all of a sudden, now we're saying that. Mm -hmm. um, what happened 4th, was he probably went out there to wrestle them up and tell them to quit hitting their kids or you know hurting their kids, and that's probably if, if he ever was out there. I guarantee he wasn't drinking coffee. Sure, absolutely. So January twenty fourth, all eight of those suspects, the the Kerr member family and Roger Holman and Tammy Jo Smith, they're all arraigned. Uh, and a press conference is held where Lyford keeps talking about this evidence. We have the evidence. The evidence that is linking Brown to Mrs. Wilson's case is more than circumstantial. I'm part of my language here, but where the fuck's the evidence? Yeah. This fool ain't got a leg I, to stand on. I'm glad you said that because that's exactly what I was about to say. Really? Then where the F is it? Yeah. Bring it forward. It's never brought forward. I could find nothing that said I anything about the evidence that was against Sergeant Brown implicating him in the kidnapping, sexual torture, and ritual sacrifice of Kelly Wilson. Bullshit. Sorry. I'm getting a little tacky at this point. But this is the <laughs> now, part of the now, story. This, this, no, this is... This, 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 this ADA or this life for asshole, he messed, the, he, he messed this up. When the Gilmer Police Department he, messed it yeah, up, watch. they did everything right. And yeah, we're, about to, have, we're about to go in-depth into that you in just have a, one second. Yeah, an innocent man who got railroaded, basically. And then you've also, on top of that, more importantly, you've got an innocent, you know, kid who has disappeared. And this guy wants to to inflate his ego and to build his social status and standing. And he knew he'd be the front page news. Exactly. He wants to he wants to put these two cases together yep. in order to bring down this big cabal that yep. is happening in East Texas, which doesn't <coughs> exist. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> so. Towards the end of January, a couple of more searches are done. They start collecting all this more evidence. The Lyford team, not the not the police department anymore. The Lyford team does these investigations. <sighs> of Danny Kerr's house finds bones and and all, animal bones again. Um, they find like uh, uh, sex beads, basically, and pair of boots allegedly worn by Kelly Wilson. You know what uh, a sex bead is, Ryan? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Continue. I just want to make sure Ryan was keeping up um, the story. Hey, I'm, I'm a man of the world. I know what's going on. <laughs> uh, you know, they find a, a mattress covering that supposedly a small portion of it was tested for human blood. It's just all of this stuff. But here's the thing. All of that can so easily be explained away. Number one, sex feeds. See, people have sexual lives, okay? People are yeah. into some freaky deaky shit. And to each their Not own. Me. That's what I say. Um, the pair of boots allegedly worn by <laughs> Kelly Wilson. <laughs> Some damn bullshit chilling. <laughs> I said, You saw me looking at her. <laughs> <laughs> the pair of boots allegedly worn by Kelly Wilson. Were these ever shown to her parents? Were these ever tested? Were these, you know, I mean, my God. And then a mattress covering that supposedly has human blood on it. What about menstrual blood? I'm That's sorry. Right. You know, Absolutely, I mean, yeah. my God. I, 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 like, people might... get nosebleeds in their sleep. Yeah, people you scratch, scratch a zit exactly. in their sleep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So at this point, Lifer team is no longer sharing any of the evidence with the Gilmer Police Department. He's like, I'm done. We're doing our own thing. You do your own thing, but I'm not giving you what you what you want or what I got. And that brings us to January 29th of 1994. Lucas Gear, Wanda's brother, first person to ever mention Kelly Wilson's name and passing and glossing over and all that stuff, comes forward and he says, hey, you know what? All that Ritual abuse stuff and sacrifice and Kelly Wilson and everything. Yeah, I made it all up. That didn't really happen. I don't know anything about it, honestly. The reason why I said that is because you were bugging me. And so in order to get you to leave me alone, I told you what you wanted to hear. And this is in mm -hmm. a statement. Yeah, and this is in a statement. And they say, well, you passed a polygraph test about your admission to all of this. He's like, I didn't know anything about it. I don't know how I passed. So... I don't know what to tell you. So at this point, all of a sudden, you see the the 
thread just winding down on the floor from this magnificent picture that Lyford's trying to paint. So he, he's like, dude, I, he, he goes to the Texas Attorney General's office and he's Shane Phelps. Uh, he's still a practicing attorney and everything. And I respect this guy after reading everything so much. He's like, I need help. I need help. I need help. He asks repeatedly, and it's not until a state representative in Gilmer comes forward and says, we need help on this. Get here. Shane Phelps comes in in 1994. Uh, and Lyford at that point is like, look, I'm ready to try the, the child molestation cases. OK. Um, at which time Sergeant Brown's attorney of files for a restraining order against Lyford to keep him from subpoenaing, sub subpoenaing witnesses from the grand jury. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, Lyford resigns as special prosecutor for the like uh, for over the Kelly Wilson force and the case, and Shane mm -hmm. Phillips takes over. There's supposed to be a three to week transition period where there's a debriefing and all that stuff. This never happens. In the same month. Shane Phelps comes out and dismisses, and his team dismisses all the charges in the Kelly Wilson case. And Phelps describes Lyford's indictments as, quote, a complete and total abandonment of the principles of criminal investigation. Hot damn. He basically he almost bankrupted Gilmer mm -hmm. and basically ruined a man's life and a delayed family's life. Mm hmm. Sergeant Brown's life and yeah. and stopped the potential for finding this girl. Yeah, you know some, something Absolutely. else I found in my research. He went to her father, Kelly Wilson's father, and said, "I've solved your daughter's disappearance." When they arrested James Lyford, right? Mm -hmm. Lyford, yeah, yes, he did. Mm -hmm. That's my mm -hmm. opinion of him. I'm only speaking mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. Come at well, me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> So he, uh, Shane Phelps also tells uh, Bags and Fleek that, which I like to flip their names and just say Flea and Bag, Fleek and Bags. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, that their services are no longer needed. Goodbye, you're gone. Bonds are reduced for Eugene and Geneva Kerr, as well as Roger Holman, Tam and Joe Smith. Both of those last two make bail. Now, from April 9th, 1994 to December 24th of 1994, there's a few couple of things that start to take place. This is a good chunk of the year, so I'm just going to start kind of telling you how this progressed past this moment. Debbie Minshew, the state representative. Social for, worker, right? Yes. For the children? Basically the social worker for the children, the worst case of the children, uh, resigns while her recent performance is under review with mm. CPS. Uh, according to Tyler Morning Telegraph, the agency's chief of field operations said officials were afraid that Minshew and Gore, quote, might have been overzealous in their pursuit of a satanic cult that was never proven to exist, end quote, and that they, quote, may have disregarded state, ag state uh, disregarded agency policies, resisted oversight, and made decisions that may have harmed the Kerr children, end quote. Hmm. You don't say. <laughs> yeah. So Connie and Wanda, Connie Martin and Wanda Kerr moved back to the Usher County Jail, and Connie makes bail in July 1994. And all of a sudden, she comes forward and she says, I was raped and harassed by Danny. Uh, claimed to have not been told to call to life her team. Uh, she did. She'd be in big trouble. She she resisted or did not get arrested in the Kelly Wilson, obviously, because she was cooperative. Um, she, let's see, oh, my God, where was I? There's so much crap happening at this point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Shane Phelps goes forward and he interviews Connie Martin for one time and one time only. Connie, at this point, comes forward and she says, everything that I said about Kelly Wilson is false. I'm recanting my statement, all of it. Uh, and she was to be taken in front of a grand jury the next day. She calls mm -hmm. Fleet, the, form, the Louisiana peace officer that was brought in under Lyford's team, where she's advised by him to, quote, tell the truth. Uh, he did not know that she had recanted, uh, but Connie told her attorney that uh, her statement would be the same as before, and she never appeared before the grand jury. Um, Life routine testifies before a grand jury, and they are under investigation. Fleek is investigated for impersonating a police officer, illegally carrying a weapon, tam tampering with a witness, abuse of authority, and illegal, illegal release of information. And Sergeant Brown, at the same time, files his suit against the Life team. Um, Lifer's appointment, obviously a special prosecutor on the child molestation cases, is revoked. Um, then all of a sudden you have uh, Alan Pusey and Victoria Lowe, reporters for the Dallas Morning News. They interview Connie Martin, where she recants her story again about Kelly Wilson. Um, 
basically telling her, uh, basically telling her cellmate that she was afraid of the lifer team. She never knew Kelly Wilson, but she was afraid of the lifer team. Now she says she's denied she ever made these statements, but it wasn't printed that she, you know. Uh, she talked she to a reporter, it. and a reporter put, wrote it down. Yeah. And so then you have a Tyler uh, NBC affiliate, a Shreveport NBC affiliate. They interview her. This woman's just everywhere being interviewed. And she tells them the same story as the Dallas uh, uh, reporters. Um, Fleek confronts her. She's still in, in contact with Fleek character. And, and asks why she lied. Her response was, quote, at least they won't kill me now. Talking about the life of them, basically. Hmm. She was that afraid of them. And didn't um, she have pretty good reason to be? That's what we're going to cover in just a second. Um, so Connie voluntarily admits to Fleek at the same time, though, that in all of this, wait a minute, I lied to the Dallas Morning News reporters uh, and television stations stating that I did it out of fear. Same situation. But now she's basically recanting her recants. She's going back to her original story at this point. She does this. She got, half, more, she got more flip-flops than Galveston. <laughs> <laughs> not <laughs> half a dozen times. Not half a dozen times. <laughs> so while all of this is taking place, though, in, in October of 1994, Gilmer Police Department gets broken into. And the photocopies... What? The, hold on. For the photocopies for the Kelly Wilson case, more or less pertaining to the Lyford team stuff and everything, um, disappears and goes missing. How now, the now, the originals were forwarded on to the AG's office, um, but unfortunately, these are also missing. So, all of Lifert's hmm. digging and researching and charges and all of everything that has to do with what all this evidence he allegedly found, poof, yep. that was the only thing hmm. stolen. Yeah. So... Eugene, Geneva, and Wendell Kerr, they're all released from the Usher County Jail. Basically, everybody gets all their charges dropped, dismissed. Everybody's out of jail, and everybody is now trying to pick up and go on with their life. Uh, from 1995, basically, to present day, Britt Ward goes on trial, convicted of aggravated perjury charges, um, you know, about his whereabouts um, on the day that Kelly vanished. Uh, he appealed this ruling, which the ruling was uh, upheld in January of 1997. He tries to attempt to sue his lawyers for $80 million, and he moves to Arizona. He never won his case for the $80 million. So. Chris Denton on the stabbing probation, he petitions for, and he receives a shortened sentence. He also moves to Arizona. Uh, Sergeant Brown and uh, Eugene and Geneva Kerr end up bringing their lawsuits against Lyford and his team, uh, Gore, Minshew, Bags, and Fleek, plus Lyford, so the five of them. All of them, unfortunately, lost their lawsuits so they appealed the, the wow. lower court's decisions the fifth circuit appellate court upheld the lower court's decisions and they lot completely lost out on their lawsuits and even had to pay their own litigation cost pretty shitty yeah um fortunately chris denton passes away in 2004 from cancer and gore passes away in 2007 uh brooks fleet passed away in 2011 uh, some sources that I was never able to find documentation on this, some sources, and there were quite a few of them, say that both Eugene and Geneva Kerr passed away in 2011. Connie Martin passed away in 2017. Danny Kerr passed away in 2018. And Brent Ward passed away in 2019. So almost so who's everybody. Still alive? So the only ones that are really still alive. Joe are Henry. Joe Henry. Michael Bybee that we, that we know yeah, of. Oh, as far as we know. As yeah. far as we know. Um, James Brown. As Sergeant far as James I know, Brown. I haven't found anything. on haven't found anything. To, he kind of yeah. disappears. You've got Wendell and Wanda. They are both still alive as well. Roger Holman and Tammy Jo Smith. I wasn't able to find a death date on any of them. But here's my thing. This is the discussion part of all of this. That is the case of Kelly Wilson and the disappearance. And why this poor girl ended up basically not just being put on the back fucking burner but completely knocked off the goddamn stove. Mm -hmm. um, she went from page one headlines to basically to the, the third was, page at the bottom of the column and type this small, and allegedly only, part of the Kelly Day Wilson disappearance case. And the only things that were said about her was her name, her age, what she was seen in when she was disappeared, what she was doing the night she disappeared. 
and that's it. There has never been any more further evidence or leads or talk furthering the case any more than that. And her last name only appears in headlines, and I'm sorry to say it, to garner more attention to the newspaper. That's it, because this is now a 30-year-old cold case that has been sitting at the Gilmer Police Department because some asshole from Galveston decided that he wanted to come in, collect all this evidence with no corroboration, pin it against a local family mm-hmm. and a known police sergeant. Known for issues and problems. Known for issues and problems. They were, as I said at the beginning, they were a family easy to make rumors about. We all know mm-hmm. what kind of people we're talking about. Um, it should and never destroyed should have a happened. good man. Yeah, destroyed a, a good man in the process. Mm-hmm. Um, and it never should have happened. Sergeant Brown was making headway in the investigation as slow as it possibly was going, but he was going somewhere. And then this red herring gets thrown into the whole freaking mix and it absolutely never should have happened. No. So I will say moving forward, if you're listening to this, if you're seeing this and you know something about the Kelly Wilson case from this day forward, this whole child sexual abuse, satanic panic cult, throw it out. Throw it out. Leave it out of Kelly Wilson's case. Mm -hmm. It does not deserve to be there. Kelly Wilson is the one that deserves to be in the spotlight. I don't know why I'm getting teary-eyed right now. And that stuff is now. I'm with you. I'm with you. She deserves. That was nothing but a distraction. Mm -hmm. And she deserves the justice that she never got. You know. That's okay, okay, man. Hey, that's okay. I mean, again, this is is one of those things that it's like the injustice Mm -hmm. around it. It is staggering that yeah. that uh, that because one somebody person was a glory can create now. this much. Yeah. Look now, Blake, stop because you got me doing it. One person can create this much chaos mm-hmm. and stop, stop. I've just been researching Answer. this case for. Look at the me, last, got me doing it too. Ryan, uh, your turn for the last month and a half, and it. This is, has been our. It's been your baby. Absolutely, mm-hmm. it has been, and it's absolutely heartbreaking to me. To know that her parents have sat here for 30 years. And wondered. And wondered where their daughter is. Mm-hmm. And what happened to her. And an asshole wants to come in. And basically. I'm sorry y'all. As Ryan said. Uh, wants to take down this this titan so to speak. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, he was going to come to take down the devil. Yeah. And. Yeah. There was no corroboration of evidence. No. I don't know why I'm fucking crying. I'm sorry, y'all. No, it's, it's just, okay, man. It, it breaks my heart. It absolutely yeah. breaks my heart. Um, because well, I mean, I, like when when it all boils down to it, we still have someone who is who has who has, this, who has vanished without a trace, and we still don't know what happened to her. And I mean, I mean, look, I'm I'm at a point that like. I'm just going to throw my theory out. I was able to put up all the suspects on my suspect board. And very quickly, I was able to eliminate a lot of the suspects on the list. But there were two that I could not eliminate off that list. And as a matter of fact, when I started researching them more and more, the only thing that I was able to do was to add more and more circumstantial evidence against them. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I don't think that this case is ever going to see the light of day of justice because those two people are now unfortunately dead. Mm -hmm. And... At this point, I don't care how it happened, when it happened, where it happened, all this stuff. Can we just find her? Can we just bring her home at this Mm -hmm. point? That if somebody out there who knows something could just go, you need to look in this place. Just trust me. And we go look and we can find her and bring her home and put her to rest. Please. Because if anything, her family deserves closure. Absolutely. If they can't get justice, they need closure. Because all I know is a beautiful young 17-year-old girl vanished without a, without a trace from basically a downtown small town, mm-hmm. um, you know, and these legitimate leads and this legitimate efforts uh, turned into a fucking witch hunt. Um, you know, and, and the sad part is, is once all this stuff started coming out in January 24th of 1994, when they were being arraigned for uh, the, the kidnapping, sexual torture and, and sacrifice of Kelly Wilson... Of course, it made second page, third page, all that stuff, because there was mm-hmm. an even bigger prosecutorial fiasco happening during that time in 1994, and that's the O.J. Simpson trial. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like Kelly's case, it just feels like it never had the chance. Um, 
it's just I don't even care about prosecution. I don't care about Justin. It's just where the hell is she? Mm -hmm. Somebody knows something. Somebody has to know something. Because we all know that whether her killer is alive or dead, at some point he talked because they all do. They all oh mess up. Mm -hmm. Somebody knows something. <clears throat> Someone's heard something. Her best friend knows how that relationship went. If you knew her, I, I personally want to ask you to re-examine those days in your mind leading up to that and see if you can remember anything that was different, anything that she might have said. Was she worried about something? Had she just been fighting with her boyfriend? Had she been having problems at work? Had she been having problems at home? There is no lead that's too small because it's going to take a small, all it takes is a crack to break an egg. We got to find that crack. Now, if someone has a lead, where would they go to report it? The best thing that I can find as of now in 2022 is that uh, you need to contact the Gimmer Police Department. Um, and I think their number is, you know what, I'll just read it off right now. Hold on. And that is Gilmer, G-I-L-M-E-R, Texas. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. And their number is 903-843-5545. And if you have a lead pertaining to One more to time. 903-843-5545. Four five, and if you have anything tips leads anything pertaining to the Kelly Wilson case, absolutely please call them. Let them know. Do it anonymously. Have somebody else. I don't know. Do something to to just get it out there. It's just time that this beautiful young girl comes home mm -hmm. and is laid to rest. And I'm hoping that what we were able to accomplish tonight was to try and cut through, cut out the freaking noise that surrounded her and put her back front and center. Mm -hmm. where she belongs because ultimately this case is about kelly wilson it is not about all this other shit that got thrown up on it um so and and to well, say that we have lived with this mm -hmm. since we started investigating it I, I would say probably at least once or twice a week we are going to have uh, up until mm -hmm. this night have gotten into discussions concerning does this even belong here? This should this be in here? What was this? Where did this go? What happens with this piece of evidence? Where is this piece of? If it could be dug up, one of the three of us had a shovel, yeah, and we mm -hmm. were looking, and we were actively trying to decipher, discern, and disclose what was honest, accurate, and truthful, and what belonged and what didn't. Mm -hmm. And I, I will say that that you guys did the lion's share of the research on this one because Blake did you the guys share the research. Yeah. I just like, read really fast, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you, I, I, I feel like this was so muddied by the other prosecutors stepping into the case yep. and rolling everything up into one big ball of wax. I yep. think that through your research, like you said, I think you have cut through the noise. I think you've cut out a lot of the bullshit and kind of cleared up the stream a little bit. So people can kind of focus on exactly who needs to be focused on. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. 100%. So mm -hmm. <laughs> you okay? I, I did not mean to leave, but whenever okay. I, I just wanted to, to show you guys what we mean, this is the part of the research that I brought home to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if you can see this and that's the other half mm -hmm. that Blake has. You see these tabs? This is everything that was relevant that I found to Mark in all of this to clean this up. This is my half. This is my Blake half. And, and y'all, I can tell our listeners right now, there is not a book to go off on this. This was all Shelly and Blake doing all this everything. reading and putting all this together, putting together a cohesive timeline. I just wanted you guys to see that when we say we have looked mm -hmm. through as much as we can possibly find to look through. Again, this is mm -hmm. my half. That's Blake's half. These are and easily every to a, page. Yeah, every page of it. Yeah, every mm -hmm. freaking page. Multiple times too. Tabs. Um, Tabs. Like I, I read some articles and listened to some podcasts and did a little bit of research, but these guys put their blood, sweat, and tears into this one. Yep. As we said, if it could be dug up, we tried. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know what? I'm going to go on record even to say that if you have a tip, you have a lead, you have something, and, and you don't feel comfortable reaching out to the Gilmer Police Department or whatever, I don't give a shit. Send us can, a message. Can they call whatever. Crime Stoppers at this Crimes, point? Uh, I believe 
that there is still a Crime Stoppers attached to the Kelly Wilson case, though I'm not 100% sure, so I don't want to put that out there. Mm -hmm. um, but Gilmore Police Department. If you are hearing this audio and you are nervous to go to the Gilmore Police Department, go on Facebook and search everything vaguely paranormal and shoot a message and go, hey, this is what I got. And, and we I'll will take be it. happy to forward it to them. I'll take it myself down there. I don't you care. You can stay anonymous, make up a screen name and... Absolutely. So now, if you mm -hmm. think you're going to be some punk ass coming in here and doing some crap, don't do that. Mm -mm. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. A legitimate tip. Don't yeah. try to be funny. We're talking about someone's life. Mm -hmm. Don't Absolutely. do that. Absolutely. So. But remember, there isn't anything that you remember that's too small. Yeah, there has I mean, to be anything. Something. I mean, sometimes the small details of what catches these type of people that do this sort of thing. Absolutely. So, well, y'all, that is the Kelly Wilson case. We want to thank y'all for joining us for this episode. Uh, mm -hmm. Please remember to go and like us on separate social media channels. Face, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, Instagram. We share different things to different social media mm -hmm. channels. So if you want to see everything that we are about, um, including our investigations and our evidence that we capture on our investigation, please go find those. Search everything vaguely paranormal and look for the sound wave. Take it away, Ryan. Uh, please go on to Apple Music. Uh, look up our look, look up our uh, uh, audio page for the podcast. Please leave us a five star review. Uh, leave any review because that helps us climb the charts and gives us more attention. So please and go and do that. Guess what? What? We're about to launch Patreon. We are. Yes, we are. I have already started filming mine. <laughs> <laughs> start filming mine this week. Child, Ryan's already been laughing at me, going, mm -hmm. "What were you doing?" <laughs> mm, tune in and see. Exactly. And we also have our website that will be live that will have all the information that you can find mm -hmm. on us on the locations that we have coming up for your public investigations where you can go it's coming, and you can buy tickets because it is coming. You can finally join us. Woo! <laughs> Anyways, you, 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 you can go stumble around in the dark. All night talking long out loud us. to things you can't see <laughs> and talking acting just well. as crazy as we do. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, but for my friends, Shelly Pruitt and Ryan Roberts, I am Blake Smith. Thank y'all so much for joining us. And we will see you next Tuesday. Bye. Night, guys. <laughs>